Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Max Latona. I'm the Executive Director for the Center for Ethics and Society at St. Anselm College. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to our program, Seven Ethical Lenses Through the Kaleidoscope. In a moment, I will introduce our special guest and speaker. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I'd like to just take a moment to say a few words about the Center for Ethics and Society, uh, which is uh, hosting this event and the EIG Forum, the special program uh, of which this is a part. The Center for Ethics in Society at St. Anselm College um, is a center that's devoted to addressing ethical issues in organizations and communities throughout the state and the region. And we do so using research, education, dialogue, and collaboration. Uh, every organization and community uh, depends upon good leadership. Uh, leadership that can help um, the organization to navigate the difficult questions that they face uh, and to help them thrive uh, as an organization or community. But good leadership is difficult, uh, as we all know. It involves navigating difficult ethical issues um, and, and, and dealing with uh, questions that involve people, real people in real time, uh, finances and resources. Uh, it's not always easy to know what the right decision is. And yet it's so important for communities and organizations to thrive. So it is my pleasure then to, uh, to welcome our, our special guest today to speak about that. Um, this, this program is a part of the Ethics and Governance Forum. Um, the Ethics and Governance Forum uh, features programs and topics related to governance, leadership, social responsibility, and the common good, all of which um, uh, are part or representative of the mission of the center. Uh, funding for this program uh, comes from a $2 million endowment created by the New Hampshire Secretary of State's Office and the Center for Public Responsibility and Corporate Citizenship awarded to St. Anselm College in 2013. Uh, that endowment was created uh, as a part of a settlement reached by New Hampshire with uh, Tyco International uh, and is administered by the University of New Hampshire Foundation. Um, so I do want to mention just before I introduce our speaker that um, uh, that this is a webinar, uh, it will be recorded, but we do uh, encourage all of you to offer uh, questions uh, using the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your, your Zoom screen. Uh, you may offer any questions or comments at any point during the talk today. Um, sometimes it's better to, uh, to send them in while they're on your mind rather than waiting till the end uh, when you might forget them. So feel free to do that and uh, I'll be serving as a moderator and uh, I hope to have all of your questions answered, uh, but if I don't, because we run out of time, I apologize in advance. Um, at any rate, uh, it is now my pleasure to, uh, to introduce uh, Linda Fisher Thornton, our featured speaker for today. Uh, Linda is an innovative leadership development consultant with a passion for ethical leadership. Her book, Seven Lenses, in its third printing, introduces a practical, seven lens model and 14 guided principles for learning ethical leadership and seeing the nuances of ethical complexity. A former bank senior vice president and now CEO of Leading in Context LLC, Linda has been in the leadership development field for over 25 years and is redefining leadership at a higher level with the ethical values built in. She is on Inc. Magazine's top 100 leadership speakers list and enjoys working with leaders across industries including global Fortune 500, nonprofit, government, healthcare, and education. She also teaches global leadership and applied ethics as an adjunct associate professor for the University of Richmond SPCS. Linda holds an undergraduate degree in linguistics and communications from the University of Virginia and a master's in adult education and human development from George Washington University. Her website, if you'd like to learn more, is leadingincontext.com. And with that, um, uh, let, uh, let, it's my pleasure now to turn it over to you, uh, Linda, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here, and thank you to all of you who are joining us. Feel free to tell us in the chat where you're joining us from so we can see um, how far and wide this group reaches. Um, I had been in the leadership development field um, for a while when I realized, and I'm going to share my screen now, so we have people from Canada and all kinds of wonderful places. All right, so I had been in the leadership development field for um, about 20 years and teaching leadership for about nine years. 
when I realized that something was really wrong with the way we were talking about leadership. We were um, talking about leadership training over here and ethics training over here. They were separate. That it made no sense to me. How could we prepare leaders for leadership without teaching them the ethics at the same time. And I realized that we weren't integrating them for the, the leaders. And in terms of leadership development, they weren't ready for what they were going to be handling um, the way we were preparing them. And I had an aha when I was attending a symposium at the University of Richmond where I teach. And it was an ethical leadership symposium. They had speakers on data privacy, ethical leadership and sustainability, ethical leadership and politics and history. And I really realized when I left there that I needed a way to pull all of that together into a bigger picture to make sense out of it. I wanted to see how the parts fit together. So I went back and looked for that model and didn't find it. Um, and long story short, I spent several years researching and writing um, a global model of ethical leadership. It's leadership with the values built in. And um, it's based on the wisdom of Plato and Thoreau and Aristotle and Confucius and the greats, but also what global emerging global groups were saying should be part of responsible business and responsible leadership. So I was really looking forward to through our leadership, how do we create a better world and a better future? And it's resonating with people right now, um, probably because the issues that we're dealing with in the world are at such a high level of complexity. And this model addresses that complexity and helps people work through it. So there is a delay with the slides, hang on. So we are finding ourselves in the hot seat dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change and lots of big, difficult issues. And this question is, has been a difficult one. What does it mean to do the right thing in a global society when we are learning just how connected we are? And unfortunately, while we're wrestling with that question, the ethics training people are getting is usually either overcomplicated with the really thick binder that no one has time to read or oversimplified. Um, just use the highest integrity, just do the right thing as if people would automatically know what that meant and be able to do it. So our leadership and our carefully tended cultures depend not on having values on our website or in our marketing brochures, but in the day-to-day -day actions that we take so that people see us living them out on, on a regular basis. So I want to take a moment to hear from you now, because while we're, we realize how much our values shape their experience, sometimes it seems like our values are unraveling, given everything that's going on. So without naming anyone or blaming anyone or any group, um, put in the chat, what settings are you seeing disagreements about the right thing to do? It could be the dinner table, it could be at work. Uh, where are you seeing these disagreements? It could even be in the media. So take just a moment, if you would, and share in the chat, what are you seeing in terms of disagreements? pharmaceutical industry, city council, social media, definitely about mask wearing. I have my chat popped out over here, by the way. Um, right. So many, so many different issues you're naming. Between employees and employers, when somebody might want someone to do something they don't think is the right thing. So, so you're seeing this too, it's happening in a lot of different settings. And with the burden of responsibility uh, and so much riding on our decisions, um, we need a, a way to put all our multiple stakeholders into perspective. And sometimes we forget that you don't see the whole picture just looking through 
one lens. You just, you get a very uh, limited perspective that way. And in order to move beyond our disagreements and um, put our competing pr perspectives together in a meaningful way, we need that bigger picture. So when we, um, we need a clear line of sight that takes into consideration the complexity of the real issues that we're having to deal with. So as I mentioned, after several years of research, um, I wrote the book, Seven Lenses, that, and the, what I'll be talking with you about is covered in more detail in the book. Um, and it's a multi-dimensional model of ethical leadership. And uh, so I'm going to walk you through all of that. It gives you a high level perspective of the nuances of ethical responsibility and the, the tricky parts of how to make ethical decisions. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick run through of all seven, and then I'm gonna dig into each lens in more detail to get you comfortable with them. Then I'm going to share some examples and a case um, to show you how you can use this to um, make better decisions in the day-to-day. -day. Um, so giving you a quick overview, lens one is profit. How much money will this make? Lens two is law. How can we follow all laws, regulations, and ethics codes? Lens three is character. How can we show moral awareness, integrity, uh, and concern for others? Uh, lens four is people. How can we show respect and care for people and bring out their best? Lens five is communities. How can we make life better in the communities we serve? Lens six is the planet. How can we demonstrate respect for life, nature, and ecosystems? And lens seven, is the highest level and the longest term, and that's the greater good. How can we make life better for future generations? So let's dig into this. Um, lens one is profit. And of course, this is all about the money, uh, income and budget and profit. And we know how important these things are to businesses. In fact, even nonprofits have to keep the lights on, have to raise money, have to decide who to take donations from, have to make tough choices about building names. There's so many things that have to be done. And the profit lens is also anything we get out of a situation, anything we value. And sometimes that can include power, control or attention or perks, favors, anything that we feel we, we get something from. Now you're probably thinking, why is profit in an ethical leadership model? And there's some reasons why it's here. One of them is that it reflects one of the perspectives in my research on ethical leadership, that the sole role of business or leadership is to make money for the shareholders. So that needed to be reflected in this model. Um, but also I wanted people to see if they stopped after just thinking about profit, how many ethical variables they would have been leaving out. I wanted people to see it all together. And the other thing is that it's, it's easier to be ethical if you don't have to worry about the money. But when you put profit into the equation, that's when it gets really tricky when you're trying to balance ethics and profit. And so that's why profit absolutely had to be here. But profit has no moral grounding on its own. So let's go on to lens two, which is law. Um, and I think about laws as the minimum standard of acceptable behavior in society, the minimum standard. So it's really the floor. And we know that it's the minimum standard because if we break the law, we are fined or sanctioned, or we go to jail or we lose our license, you know, something we're punished. So it's really, really the punishment threshold and not the ideal level of behavior. Now this lens is letting us look at laws, regulations, but also ethics codes, rules, procedures, and the ever changing COVID-19 guidance that we've been dealing with. And there are different ways you can think about the law. You can think about laws very literally and look for loopholes and try to make more money. 
basically dropping back to the profit lens, or you can aim higher and look for the values that are behind the laws. So every law will have some values behind it, why we have that law, but they're not written into the names of the laws or the wording in the laws. So you have to figure out what they are. So in Virginia, we have to wear a seatbelt when we're driving. And you can probably think about, well, what are the values that's protecting? It's protecting human life in human safety, right? And the laws that prevent us from hitting or harassing each other in the workplace, those laws are protecting human rights, human dignity, um, people's well being and safety. So we really need to look at laws in terms of the values behind them. So if we're manufacturing a product, we need to manufacture it to the level of the value. So if, if we're looking at a safety law that says that you know, we manufacture something, it has to be to these specifications, what we really wanna do is aim for making it a safe product to protect the people who are using it because that's why we have safety laws. They're intended to protect those values. So since laws are the minimum standard of acceptable behavior, let's go on to lens three, character. Now, this is my um, individual ethics. Some people talk about this as a moral compass, um, and it's, it's your integrity, the alignment of what you think and say and do, and your moral awareness. It's a, about um, thinking about how what you do impacts a wide variety of, of others, other constituents. And here we really get into transparency and fairness. And when you add character to profit and law, it's really a game changer because now you're considering your impact on others, not just uh, making money and following the minimum standard. So this is my personal ethics, but I'm in the world with other people. So let's look at the people lens, lens four. Here we could show respect and care for individuals, but also at the more collective level, we need to show respect for differences and create an environment with full inclusion and prevent harm from coming to people. This is really about um, creating the kind of environment where everyone can thrive everyone can do their very best work and um, use their talents and skills. People are part of communities. Now, when you volunteer in the community, it supports the community. You might improve uh, food availability or schools or parks. There's so many different things you could do in the community. And it doesn't just benefit the community. So let's say, that I am helping feed the homeless. The, the homeless are helped, but also my moral awareness increases because I see that others don't live the same way that I do. And I have an opportunity and even a responsibility to, to try to help them. Now, through the planet lens, we're starting to get this kaleidoscopic picture that you see when you look through all the lenses at one time. Now at the level of the planet lens, you have to be a systems thinker. So you wanna demonstrate respect for life, nature and ecosystems. And those, that's all very, very connected and ever-changing. If you think about the seasons and, and our weather patterns and animal migration, you can't just look at a piece of land and say, okay, this is the way that land is always going to be. Uh, it could be flooded tomorrow or you know animals are migrating over that land so if you want to put up uh, for example a fence or a border you have to take into consideration all of these cyclical changes before you can really see the impact of what you're going to be doing on the planet one way to think about this is if you have an acre of trees timber is really valuable you can sell it and you can make a lot of money through the profit lens but through the planet lens, we realize that when you clear cut trees on land, 
then it causes increased respiratory ailments in the communities around that land because we really need that, that oxygen from the, the trees to be healthy. So through the planet lens, we're thinking about how we rely on the planet for our survival and we wanna protect the planet for future generations. And the seventh lens is the greater good, the highest level and the longest term of all the lenses. And this is making life better for future generations. And it's long after we're gone. And um, it's, it's interesting because this might be local or regional, could be national, global. It could be a big thing or a small thing, but just in some way, making life better for future generations. Now, the picture you get when you look through all of these lenses is, is very helpful in understanding a situation. So I'm going to share a case with you, but first I'm gonna talk with you about some things we've seen happen during the extended pandemic that will help bring this into perspective. So through the profit lens, you probably remember at the beginning of the pandemic, um, people were buying up all the hand sanitizer and hoarding that and then price gouging and charging over $100 for one hand sanitizer on, on the internet. And so um, people have tried to profit from other people's misfortune um, during the pandemic. In terms of the law, the laws and regulations have been constantly changing and businesses have had to adapt continually to the changes in, in um, their particular way of doing business. Um, through the character lens, um, some people have demonstrated concern for others in mask wearing, getting vaccinated, and others have used fraudulent vaccination records to travel to places that required vaccination. Um, through the people lens, people have helped each other. Um, people have um, shown concern for others and helped them in the community. Through the community's lens, um, grocery stores have kind of done a special thing for seniors and made it easier to shop uh, by doing the pickup groceries that we've all enjoyed where you didn't even have to go in the store and someone would shop for you. Um, so, and through the, the planet lens, when everything ground to a halt at the beginning of the pandemic, um, people stopped traveling. We weren't flying, we weren't, we weren't traveling at all. And so the pollution levels went way down globally and it was startling and really helps inform our understanding of our impact on the planet. And the canals in Venice actually ran clear, which they had not seen happen. And um, through the greater good lens, um, some businesses offered paid services for free to help people adapt. If you think about uh, Zoom allowing a longer length of time for their uh, free meetings when everyone had to go virtual quickly and didn't have a lot of time to adapt. And publishers have lifted restrictions on eBooks in some cases so that we'd have something to read while we were in isolation, working from home. Um, so a lot of people were working toward the greater good. So I'm going to talk with you about a case now. This is real. Um, during the pandemic, um, the, there's been a problem about conducting um, trials in person because of the risk of con you know, passing COVID-19 from person to person. So, one thing that has been tried is to conduct trials um, in person, but with only vaccinated jurors. So basically, this means you would just dismiss all jurors who were unvaccinated. The sources that I've used to research this case are at the bottom, the American Bar Association, the National Center for State Courts, U.S. Courts, RAND, and Reuters. Um, 
So let's put this through all seven lenses. Through the profit lens, this approach costs money. So it does not check off the profit lens. It doesn't make us money, it costs money. So it gets an X here because we have to get plexiglass shields and it, we have additional safety measures. And interestingly, because lawyers have to like to lean in and whisper to their clients, they can't do that when they're six feet apart. So they have to have special headsets due to the distance. And so um, we get an X there in the profit lens. Through the law lens, um, this approach raises some privacy concerns. We know how private medical information is, but now all of a sudden we know all those jurors are vaccinated. So that does not check off um, potentially privacy following privacy rules. And also there are concerns that this could increase appeals because it doesn't, it's not, there's not enough jury diversity and that many cases could be appealed. Through the character lens, we can check this off to say that it's morally aware to want to keep people safe by requiring that the jurors um, be vaccinated. So we give it a check there, but also it's not morally aware to restrict the jury diversity. So we also uh, have a problem there. Through the people lens, um, you're protecting people partially in the courtroom through requiring vaccination and potentially also masking, but you've, all, you've directly reduced the diversity of the jury of the peers, which isn't fair to the people who are on trial. Through the community's lens, um, I would argue that requiring that all jurors be vaccinated restricts the jury pool and doesn't fully meet the definition of a jury of your peers. Um, through the planet lens, this still requires travel, which can have a negative impact on the planet, but it does check off protect, trying to protect life, trying to protect our lives by um, only having vaccinated jurors. Through the greater good lens, I would say this is not a fair way to select a jury of your peers. You could still transmit COVID-19 and this could unintentionally encourage people not to get vaccinated in order to avoid jury duty. So let's contrast that with another approach that's being used, which is conducting virtual trials. So here through the profit lens, this checks off the profit lens because it's cheaper and it also allows judges to fill in from anywhere when they're not busy. So you get um, much in terms of benefit for profit. Through the law lens, this moves cases through the system faster, checks that off, but there are concerns about witness believability when you're virtual and also the change in the dynamics where you don't have the, the prosecutor standing over the witness, you know, questioning them. Um, so there's some dynamic, courtroom dynamic concerns. Through the character lens, um, this one gets two check marks. It's morally aware to keep people safe and to maintain juror diversity. Through the people lens, it protects people, right? Because there's no contact, it's all virtual. And yet it creates access issues for some people who may not have access to the technology that they need to participate virtually. So they would, that would need to be mitigated with loaner technology. Um, or setting up satellite locations where people could go to participate in the jury trials. So through the community's lens, you've maintained jury di juror diversity for fair trials, that's checked off. Through the planet lens, you've reduced or eliminated travel and you've protected life completely because people are not coming in contact with one another. And through the greater good lens, You've maintained jury pool fairness and eliminated the risk of exposure. Um, so we check that off as well. So when you compare these side by side, it really starts to come into focus. And I want to call your attention to the fact that we're seeing the nuances here that you just don't see when you say, well, is that ethical or not? This is much more of a level of detail. So within a lens, you can have a check mark that yes, it honors it, 
and an X mark, but not over here. So now we're beginning to see the real, real situation, the real complexity of, of our ethical issues. So these nuances are extremely helpful in understanding what's going on in an ethical situation. So the names of these lenses are familiar. I picked words that people would know and be able to remember. There are only seven of them, which is the number of digits in a local telephone number. So people report that they can remember them and kind of go through them in their heads when they're facing a situation without any materials with them. Um, and it gives us a very, very different picture of um, leadership and, and ethics because we are looking beyond ourselves to others and to society and to the future. And um, this is a more engaging kind of leadership and, and it really creates a very deep level of meaning. It's a more, it's the kind of leader you wanna work for that would be honoring all of these lenses. And it also shows collaboration and a shared purpose. We have um, multiple stakeholders and we need to meet all of their needs and not just uh, a few of them. And one of the things about this perspective is that it includes the interpersonal um, and the personal ethics, as well as environmental and societal. It includes short-term considerations and long-term considerations. So it's really giving us the full, full kaleidoscopic view of the impact of our choices. So I wanna give you an interesting example. If you have a toxic leader who is a pillar in the community, is that leader ethical? Um, so the answer to that question is yes and no, because yes, the leader could be considered ethical through the community's lens if they are a pillar of the community, they're volunteering or donating money to help. But in terms of their being, them being toxic interpersonally, they would not be honoring the people lens and they would not be demonstrating character because that wouldn't be very morally aware. And they probably would bump into trouble with the law in terms of bullying and harassment regulations. So you can't just say, is that person ethical or not? Or is this situation ethical or not? It is not a yes or no question. We need to see the nuances and we need to think about it in this important multi-dimensional way, not just one perspective at a time. So the best decisions will honor as many of these lenses as, as we can possibly incorporate. So all of that is very interesting and helpful, but there's, there's even more here that's hiding in plain sight. And there's additional complexity that only becomes visible when you look at ethics in a multidimensional way um, and seeing it through multiple lenses. So there are many combinations of these lenses. I am not a mathematician, but I know that there are a lot of combinations here because you could have any one of these lenses that you're making a decision based on, or any two, any three, any four, any five, any six, or all seven, that's a lot of possible combinations. And it really helps us understand why the field has not agreed on one definition of ethical leadership, because all of the scholars that were studying it were describing it from different combinations of these lenses and saying, well, that, that's definitely ethical leadership. And someone else saying, no, this is definitely ethical leadership. And they're all describing uh, parts of a bigger situation and, and not realizing that. Um, one thing that's interesting to think about is who champions these lenses in the organization. So if you think about who champions the profit lens, generally finance, 
um, legal department will will be looking out for laws and HR will look out for people. There may be um, a community area or a sustainability department. But then you start thinking, who's looking out for character and who's looking out for the greater good? And this is when you begin to see, okay, there's not a department for that. You, you really have to have the leader at the very top of the organization honoring all of these lenses and particularly watching out for character and the greater good and carrying that through the whole organization and to modeling it for all the leaders who then model it for all the employees and it carries throughout the entire organization. So it's a definite ethical responsibility of, of all leaders. So that, that adds another layer of complexity, but uh, I'll, I'll build on that and give you a little bit more. Um, my background is in adult education and human development. And going through all of this, I discovered there weren't just seven different lenses there's actually a developmental continuum here. Um, and if you look at this graphic that looks like a megaphone, if I'm holding that megaphone close to me, the profit lens is the smallest part, right? And that's what's in it for me. That's my personal gain. But then if I start incorporating um, concern for other people, now I'm showing concern for self and others. And then if I show um, concern for communities and the planet, the greater good. I'm showing concern for self, others, and society. And this parallels the human development models of Kohlberg and Erickson and others. So this is a developmental, moral development piece where we need to incorporate more of the lenses as we go along. And Moral development only happens when you continue learning. So we have to continue learning in order to progress. And we need to start from wherever we are. If we're only considering um, the first four lenses, for example, then we start focusing on communities and building that into our decision-making. And we keep adding them until we can consider all of them when we're making decisions. Um, and this, this really helps um, put into perspective what's going on in the world. It sort of gives you a little inside view of, of what, is, what could be happening with a lot of the disagreements. And um, so we, in order for this to work, for us to develop on this continuum, we have to have the humility to admit that we don't have all the answers and that we need to learn from people who disagree with us. Disagreeing is, is not the end of the world. It's actually a healthy sign of, of good dialogue and you don't want to, to lose that. So we're going to need to be open to hearing perspectives that we might not agree with to enrich our understanding of issues if we're going to make the best ethical decisions. So um, there is a graphic here that shows you some ways you could use your new ethical lenses and this kaleidoscopic perspective. And I'm gonna talk you through these a little bit and then I'll ask you to talk about your takeaways from the discussion and how you can use your, your new lenses. So values have to be at the center of a meaningful workplace. And so the seven lenses is here in the center. And one of the most helpful things that this offers is a common language for talking about values so that you can be sure you're including all the right dimensions of concern when you're making a decision. And it helps with building community. It gives you a common frame of reference for thinking about your impact on constituents and for planning and that sort of thing. It helps you see the different perspectives, the interests of 
the different stakeholders and how um, those can be upheld. It helps you make principal decisions. You saw in the case that I walked you through that it's very helpful, not just for looking at one situation, but comparing and contrasting and seeing which one would check off more of the lenses and be the more ethical choice. And it's also useful for making principal decisions together with a group. And some groups even like to have individuals champion the, you know, certain lenses so that they make sure that all of the lenses are heard in, in the dialogue. And it helps you develop solutions for the common good because you are seeing this societal impact at a very high level and you can imagine um, ways to engage the stakeholders and come up with responsible solutions that support the common good. So this graphic might get you thinking about some takeaways. I'm gonna ask you two questions and the next slide has the questions on, on it. But um, the first one is gonna be, what are your insights? What, what are your biggest takeaways? What resonated with you? And then the other one is, what, what do you want to do about it? How can you put this into practice? So please take a moment to share in the chat what resonated with you and how will you turn your insights into action? In other words, what are you going to do about what you've learned here today? So while we're waiting for um, the comments to come in in the chat, I want to point out that the seven lenses model aligns with what we know about brain science in terms of needing a meaningful schema and sticky, easy to remember parts that people can call up and use um, easily. I also wanna point out there's a very big difference between critical thinking where you narrow down your thinking um, from somewhere to a, a finite point um, that may or may not include ethics. If you're rushed, you can rush to judgment without even thinking about them. Ethical thinking in contrast with that is where you're broadening your thinking and taking it to uh, a much higher level to incorporate ethical values, to uh, make choices for everyone's benefit and well-being. So I'm going to take a minute and see if we have things coming in on the chat, uh, feel free to answer one or both of these questions. Um, yeah, when you have to choose between paths, there's a, this is a well-structured way to think through it. Good, yeah, it gives us you a framework to, to guide you. I mean, we, with the complexity of the situations we're dealing with right now, um, going in, and just trusting our gut or just you know, trusting ourselves to make an ethical decision isn't good enough at the level of complexity that we're facing. There's a better chance of inculcating ethical leadership or encouraging a leader to actually have ethics. Sometimes that's the biggest hurdle. Yes, I mean, if, you, if someone is thinking about ethics in a very limited or self-interested way, this model sort of brings into perspective the things that they are, are overlooking. It's not just right or wrong, but you can make a decision taking into account all seven lenses, right? It's not, it's not the oversimplified way we've been talking about it. Is that ethical or not? That question does not really help us at the level of complexity we're facing. Wow, wonderful. Character in the greater good. We don't have organizational structures to safeguard those and too often not the planet either. That is absolutely true. That's an important concern. It's not yes or no answers allows for different perspectives. Yeah, very nice. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, we can be quick to judge. Oh gosh, we are all guilty of that. This helps keep us from leaping to judgment. That's a really great one. Um, tools to evaluate corporations and organizations in our everyday lives. 
that we look at different at businesses in a different way now. And we're at a point where um, consumers are tending to want to vote based on spending their money on ethical companies. People want to work for workplaces where leaders are honoring all of these lenses. That's what they're hoping for and expecting and asking questions about in the interviews. Um, so this really can help um, organizations be ready and develop the kinds of cultures um, that will resonate with people and attract um, the best possible workers. So there are many, many tools available at leadingincontext.com. If you haven't already figured it out, I'm very passionate about this topic. And um, there are over 600 articles and videos and tools there for you. So feel free to learn more about what we've talked about there. And um, it has been a pleasure getting to be in conversation with you and uh, look forward to finding out what your questions are. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, I think uh, I just want to reiterate to everybody that if you have a question or a comment, um, please share it on the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your screen. And we're going to go through some of those questions in a moment. I think I'll take this opportunity while people are maybe thinking of questions um, to mention a few things of my own. Um, so first of all, Linda, really impressed with um, your presentation. Um, so I teach ethics and uh, the danger with teaching ethics in the classroom is that it has um, a tendency sometimes to become very abstract and academic. And what I really like about your presentation is um, this is very practical. This is something that people in any um, organization or community can apply in a meaningful way. Um, it's balanced, it's practical, it's realistic. Um, oftentimes, you know, when we teach ethics, uh, as I mentioned in the chat, you know, it's about ignoring things like profit, ignoring things like um, what the law might say. It's all about principle, you know, and doing the right thing. And there's a place for that. I mean, I think there's a place for civil disobedience. There's a place for ignoring money and profits. But practically speaking, most leaders in most organizations have to face those questions. Um, they can't simply turn a blind eye to what, what the, uh, their CFO is telling them about the new policy um, or, or what the law might say. They have, to, they have to be considerate of these things. So really, really, uh, really a very interesting presentation. Now, I have a, I have a question. So it seems to me the devil is in the details with this. So um, I'm sure if, if we talked about your book, we'd have an opportunity to see what you have to say about this. But it seems to me each one of these elements has its own complexity. Um, you know, I'm sure a, a finance person can tell us about the complexity of, 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 of finances and profits. But for example, um, when we're talking about character, what could you share with us um, that might help us understand how we evaluate that lens? For example, are there any particular values or principles that we should keep in mind when we're, when we're reading a question or a situation through the lens of character? So if you could talk a little bit more about that, that would be great. That's a great, great question. Um, and I have blogged about this quite a bit. Um, because it's a common question. And these days it has to include um, respect and care for people. It has to include um, respect for differences and an understanding of um, the leader's role in the organization, in the world, the, you know, the responsibility to have a positive impact on people. Um, it's, there are so many pieces to it that my answer is, well, you might want to search on that on the blog because I have blogged about the dimensions of uh, moral awareness, how to tell if someone is morally aware, you know, before you're going to hire them or before you're going to vote for them, you know, how do you make that assessment? Um, and Part of it is how they talk about people, you know, not dividing them into us and them, 
groups, but but taking a fully inclusive perspective and um, and it's the way they think about um, their their long term responsibilities versus their short term responsibilities. Some of the other things that I have already talked mm -hmm. about, um, and it it really is: are they leading based on values? Can they articulate what those values are? Do they know? Uh, have they ever thought about it? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, so there's so, so many, so many different pieces. And uh, I've also blogged about ethical competence and the variables of that. And they're, you know, legally being aware, morally aware from the legal perspective, and then from the people perspective, and then from the planetary perspective. So it's, it's yeah. a very big, it's a very big question, but yeah. there's a lot of guidance there. Yeah. On the and I, and I'm, as I'm listening to you, I can't help but think that w virtue ethics might be able to speak to that because you're speaking a lot, I think, about the, the so-called virtues that an Aristotle might speak about, um, generosity, compassion, um, self-discipline, um, courage, justice and fairness, loyalty. Those right. things might, you know, maybe, so I mean, what you're saying is not a single litmus test, I guess, for determining what, what counts as good character, but, um, but maybe those are the kinds of values or virtues now, having having said that, we've got a lot of questions I need to get okay. to. So let me um, let me start with one. Uh, what happens from an anonymous person? What happens when there is a serious conflict between two or more lenses? Does one of them necessarily trump the other? Like, for example, people over profit. That is a great question. Um, it's not a math formula. So you saw when we went through on the case that you'll have some checks and some X's in different places. But what if you do have, you're honoring um, the people lens, but not honoring profit or, or honoring um, the planet lens, but not people. It helps to start know, by knowing what your values are. If your organization, if you, you individually or your organization will know the values that they want to uphold, then those values seem to be ones that you might pay particular attention to and add weight to. But you can also, you can also weight these based on your priorities. What you can't do is throw any of them out. <laughs> you can't say, I'm just not gonna think about that. You know, that, that wouldn't be responsible. But when you have the complexity we're talking about here, you, you may have to um, weight them and, and you know, play, play them against each other. For example, the whole, the whole naming of buildings thing has been such a big issue and that affects the profit lens. It impacts the communities. It impacts um, how people feel about being in those buildings. And so it touches on so many different lenses and you you will have to balance it out and in in that case a case like that yeah you might have to give up um, a large endowment if you don't want to name a building after someone who hasn't been ethically upstanding so you have to make those trade-offs the other thing i'll say is that sometimes if you uh, let profit be your trade-off let's say you do something that costs you money right now and it's not going to check off the profit lens. It might check off the profit lens longer term though. Uh, so if you make a really ethical decision as an organization, it might be costly, but it will, it could attract people to your business to who say, I really like what they did. And it can cause such a groundswell of, um, of support. Um, the, an example is University of Tennessee, the little boy was wearing a homemade to, uh, volunteers shirt and his his classmates teased him and bullied him because he had this homemade shirt and when they got wind of it the university sent him a box of stuff that he could have from the university but they also printed up the homemade t-shirt that he that he drew on a piece of paper they printed it up and started selling it. And they, I mean, it was just, they sold thousands of them because everyone said this was the right thing to do to support him and to show concern for him and to say, hey, bull bullying is not okay. So it became a symbol for anti-bullying. So yeah, that cost them money, but then they made money on those t-shirts and the goodwill that that created is huge. 
So hopefully that shows you how sometimes there are trade-offs, but sometimes it can come back in positive ways longer term if the trade-off at the moment was that profit lens. Great. Um, we have a number of other questions. Uh, so David asks or um, mentions it can sometimes be difficult to interact with people who could be helped by our leadership, but don't necessarily have the same perspective as we do, most often from a willful uh, or unconscious lack of understanding or respect for the same values. How would you suggest approaching um, this or these kinds of people in a positive way to have a kind of positive impact with them? That's a really tough question. <laughs> I would have expected to get at least one really tough question. Um, yeah, if, if someone doesn't seem to be operating from a value center, but maybe they just don't realize how important it is to do that. Maybe they haven't taken your class, Max. They haven't taken my class. They don't know this whole um, perspective. Um, so the first thing you have to do is show moral awareness, which I think in, it's already written into the question. You realize that they might not be doing it intentionally. They just might not be aware. You have to give people credit for the fact that maybe their parents didn't teach them. You know, they didn't they didn't get the right education to to understand the importance of those values. And so one of the most important things we can do is listen and you know really find out where they're coming from first and then take the opportunity to we could say you know i live i like to live out these values these are my highest priority values these are the ones that i think are the most important and you know if you share that with them and then think okay well they don't they they become more aware right you're increasing their moral awareness but you're not being too pushy about it because one thing people don't like is to be told what to do uh, they don't like to be told how to think either. <laughs> so uh, the gentle approach that your question implies would be the best approach here. Great. Um, and Bill Delarfano asks about small companies. He mentions as most small companies don't have the depth of feedback to support um, these lenses, where could they reach out to get that kind of feedback? And I think the idea is that each one of these lenses that are important for um, this kind of ethical perspective requires feedback from other people in some important way. Um, how, how would you recommend leaders or a smaller organizations who don't necessarily have that kind of collaborative um, uh, support uh, to manage this kind of thing? That's a really good question, Bill. Um, the Getting feedback um, can be done. There, there's a thing happening in, in large organizations now called the empathy interview. Um, it doesn't cost anything, but you, you find a selection of your audience, your target audience of that particular constituent, and you ask them to tell you what's on their mind, what's important to them, how, you know, what they need from you and how you're doing in whatever it is you're assessing and you get their input into um, the design of your products, for example, or services, uh, the way that you might evaluate yourself on how well you're doing ethically speaking. Um, and I don't know if I'm actually addressing your question, so please let me know if I didn't quite hit on that, but I think asking is, is the easiest way um, to get a sampling of the population and, and reach out to people. Of course, social media makes this super easy, <laughs> is if you put a question out there, you usually get a pretty quick response, uh, but it is more public. So this could also be done in a more private way. Um, and when you have plans of what you're going to do, then getting that feedback on um, how does this sound to you would be really important. And you see this a lot and when there's a community that's building a new building or something. They have the, the open forums where they hear from people to find out um, what concerns they have about zoning changes or, or that type of thing. So basically it, it has to be a dialogue because this it's relational. Ethics is really, it has to include the relational piece. So the, they're really, I, I, you've called attention to a really interesting point. There needs to be a data collection piece to make sense out of all this, as well as just the quick research you can do on your own to um, 
to understand the, as target audience. So we're almost out of time. Uh, maybe maybe one or two quick more questions here. So um, uh, Anonymous asks, have you seen many corporations changing their policies based on consumer demand for them to act as an ethical global citizen? And I'm gonna add to that and say, okay, if it's consumer demand that's driving their concern about people, community, the planet, the greater good, isn't that really profit that's driving the ethical lens there? What do you think about that? Yeah, so if they, if they change because of consumer pressure, then are they more ethical or are they just opportunistic? <laughs> the answer is both, both, okay? So one of the things I write about in the book is positive intent and impact. You, you gotta have both. If you have positive intent, you're gonna do it right up front anyway. You're just gonna do it the first time right. But if you don't have positive intent, but then you're forced into doing something, you can still have a positive impact by doing it. So you can still be ethical in some part of this um, by being forced to make a change and consumers are, are causing so much more positive change to happen now because they get on social media and they say, hey, I just watched you stomp on my suitcase. I don't like that. You know, and you know whatever's going on, it, it's going to hit social media and people are going to um, put pressure on the companies to change their ways in how they treat people or how they take advantage of people. And so, yeah, I did. I, I hope I answered that question fully. Yeah, that's good. One last question. I, I might have to modify a little bit, but Lois asks, how would you design a course for high school students that teaches ethics using the New Hampshire Constitution? Now, I'm going to assume you're not familiar with the New Hampshire Constitution, but maybe just generally speaking, if you were to teach a course for young people in high school, um, uh, using this approach. How would you put such a course together? I'm curious. I have spoken in high schools. Um, some forward thinking teachers realize, hey, college is way too late for people to get this. And I will tell you that the, the high school groups that I have met with, um, they, they are shocked by what they hear with what, when I share some of what I have shared with you today. They, their jaws drop. It's just, it's, it's startling to them and it shouldn't be. I think we need to start earlier. Um, so if you have, if you taking the, um, the, the constitution, you can actually assess it through all seven lenses. What, what is, you can break it down into those sections and then talk about it in that context, which would give them a bigger picture of why it has different components. So that would be my suggestion is just to break it down through the seven lenses and tell them about it that way. And then they get they have a sort of a bigger picture perspective. Basically you're saying you could look at any issue or question, including say the New Hampshire constitution from these seven lenses, how it affects impacts the greater good community, people, um, the law, profits and so on and so forth. It's very interesting. Well, Linda, we're out of time. Uh, I want to thank you on behalf of our audience and the center for your wonderful insights and, and spending time with us today. I want to thank our audience for joining us today and offering such wonderful insights and, and questions. Um, and I just want to encourage everybody uh, to keep track of us center through our center through our website at www.anselm.edu forward slash ethics. Um, you can join our emailing list and we'll send you further notes about programs coming up. And hopefully, Linda, we can have you back again for another program in the future. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that, we conclude the program. And thank you again, everybody.